Welcome to episode 252 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm all right, Rob. How are you doing? Doing okay. Doing okay. I don't think I have any news to share myself. You? No, not at the moment. We're still mostly in a wait and see what happens with CPP Con and, and all of the things kind of perspective for my part. Yeah, I, I will say we're a little disappointed that our local government here is not treating the uh, ongoing pandemic more seriously. We're, uh, our numbers are going up and they're, they really should enforce a, like a mask wearing policy. My wife and I have been writing our governor and mayor this week. We are in Colorado supposed to always wear our mask when we're out. And I would say I, Jen and I did some shopping yesterday and it was almost 100% of people had a mask on. Yeah, it's much better than what we're seeing here. Although yeah. I'll say some of them were wearing it, you know, below their nose or below yeah. their chin. <laughs> but it was... <laughs> so there, there's an attempt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, at the top of the episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, we got a lot of Reddit comments on last week's episode with uh, Ben Smith on WebAssembly. And uh, this one comment on Reddit was just asking, what is the use case? And I, I guess we didn't talk too much about use cases. We did talk a lot about like emulators and virtual machines as possible use cases, but I think maybe that's not the most intended use case. And uh, there is a link you can look at on WebAssembly's website that shows a whole bunch of use cases um, and uh, a couple others were listed in this Reddit thread so you can go take a look. Sounds good. Yeah. But basically like any, you know, you can think of old like Flash video games. That's a real good one where instead of using Flash or other little embedded you know, scripts, you can now use WebAssembly, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cps.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Gabby Dos Race. Gabby is a principal software engineer at Microsoft, where he works in the area of large-scale software construction tools and techniques. He's also a researcher and longtime member of the C++ community, author and co-author of numerous extensions to support large-scale programming, compile time and generic programming. His research interests include programming tools for dependable software. Prior to joining Microsoft, he was assistant pre- professor at Texas A&M. Dr. Dos Reyes was a recipient of the 2012 National Science Foundation Career Award for his research in compilers for dependable computational mathematics and educational activities. Gabby, welcome back to the show. Oh, good morning. Uh, good to be here. I'm curious about this uh, NSF Career Award. So that's just acknowledging what you've done through, it's not one specific thing, but through your, the course of your whole career? Um, so it is for early uh, career faculty you know, researchers, like mm-hmm. um, let's say in your first five to seven years career, um, and they look at what you've done, uh, they kind of you know, programming you're conducting, you know, sorry, research you're conducting, and you, you get to write a, a grant and explain what you want to do and they say for the next 10 years. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and they look at your track records. And, you know, it, it, it's a program that is uh, one of those high risk, high rewards. Um, so it is very competitive. Okay, so it's been almost 10 years then since you received the award. How, how yes. are you looking? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, yeah. I um, After I left... Uh, a and M, take a and M. I had to relinquish uh, the award. Part of it. Yeah, and it was good till I left uh, academia. But okay. you know, interestingly, all that I've been doing at Microsoft is right, uh, uh, you know, on target. Um, that same year, um, I had another grant from NSF two to work on uh, modular uh, generate programming concepts. So we got concepts. Uh, into C plus plus twenty, and we got modules into C plus plus twenty. So I think I can write back to NSF and say, "Hey, I've done my part." <laughs> <laughs> Sounds awesome. Awesome. Okay, well, Gabby, we got a couple news articles to discuss, and then we'll start talking more about uh, some of that work you just mentioned, like modules and concepts and contracts. Okay. All right, so this first article, uh, which we're definitely going to want to get your opinion on, Gabby, is. Uh, 
Microsoft Rust is the industry's best chance at safe systems programming. And this is on uh, a website called The New Stack, which I, I'm not familiar with. But yeah, uh, the article is covering, I guess, the viewpoint of this one uh, Microsoft employee who did a talk, um, Ryan Levick. Yep. He's a cloud developer advocate, and he talked about uh, how Microsoft is starting to switch from Rust, or I mean, from C++ to Rust for some of its infrastructure software. And uh, I wanted to, you know, hear from you. Uh, how, how much is actually changing at Microsoft with uh, C++? Is your job on the line? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I think the first thing uh, to say is uh, is that uh, the title of that article, and that wasn't the only article that was written on the topic, there were quite a few, mm -hmm. uh, but that title was very sensational, like, you know, <laughs> they need to have people click on, on, <laughs> on this stuff. Right. Um, but, you know, going to the core of the topic, it, you know, what I think I wanted to say is, Microsoft is a really big company uh, and employs a lot of smart people, a lot of them. And the thing you have with a lot of smart people is you have a lot of uh, diverse point of view ideas. And uh, right now, um, what is going on is that there is a, a group of people uh, in MSRC. So MSRC is the Microsoft Security Response Center. And... Um, also in the Windows uh, division, um, principally in the Windows division, uh, looking at, so this is purely learning phase. Uh, like okay. today, as I'm talking to you, there is no product shipping of sort of Windows or Microsoft product shipping with uh, written in Rust. Uh, okay. you know, uh, the, the division I'm in, which is the developer division, you know, the division in charge of uh, uh, developing, no, producing developer tools and, and supporting for Microsoft uh, is uh, very much committed uh, to C++. It is a, a core programming language that uh, Microsoft supports and that Microsoft promotes. So, no, we are not telling people go and, and switch from C++ to... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, that, that article was very much sensational and I think I saw some of the discussions on Reddit uh, where someone says, oh, he was actually misquoted. Uh, Ryan was misquoted in terms of what we're saying. So he was saying something and then some, you know, journalist, whatever it was, you know, went, you know, extrapolated. Um, so, uh, it, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, so um, I haven't received any signal that I should be updating my uh, CV and look at <laughs> <sword. laughs> And uh, I will tell my uh, my friends using Mac, you know, C plus plus in general, not just Microsoft compiler, but C plus plus in general. That now you're fine, uh, you're good. Uh, that being said, I think there is a core to the problem that uh, I think far too often we don't um, we we don't take sufficiently seriously, uh, which is that. Uh, yes, there are problems uh, with you know, memory safety, type safety, and you know there were some studies in the Chromium code base where they say they have you know what two thirds of their um, security bugs related to components written in C and C plus plus. I think that have been also popularized, and 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 that matches some other experience that we've seen internally uh, uh, at Microsoft. So. There is a real problem that uh, components, uh, some components written in C++ are subject to uh, vulnerability. And the real question we should ask is why. Now, it, it is easy to go from, oh, it is written in C++, therefore C++ is bad, to why is it actually happening? And there are a lot of, um, uh, you know, um, factors, contributors, contributions there that, you know, we need to look at uh, very calmly, like level-headed and scientifically. Like, we are engineers. We are supposed to be using science first before we jump onto emotion or, um, you know, some other <laughs> uh, hyperbole stuff. So, um, you know, the first thing is, why do we have this? You can say, well, the language doesn't provide enough you know, adequate uh, 
functionality or features to support, you know, people writing good code. Right? And I was like, oh yeah, look at Rust. Rust has borrow checker and then you don't get these things. I think when people look at the reality, it's more, uh, <laughs> much messier. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you, you can go on, on Rust website and some, I forgot the name, but I'll, I'll find the link and send it to you. And, and you can look at what are the vulnerabilities associated with components written in Rust. And you'll mm-hmm. see the visual <laughs> suspect. You know, use after free, type confusion, that kind of stuff. Basically, the same problems that we have in, in C and C++. So the real question is, what can we do uh, in C++ to to put those issues at base? Um, Bjarne and I have been uh, looking at uh, some ways to get there. So essentially, a good chunk of my time in coming months uh, would be specifically to work in there. Uh, and, and 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 to be honest, a lot of people have looked at this, and a lot of work. Uh, Herb has published um, a series of papers, and I think he even had uh, uh, CPCon talk on, on on checking for memory mm-hmm. safety and, and that kind of stuff. So a lot of people have been looking at this, and I think it is time now for us, no, in particular Microsoft, who you know, uh, produced a lot of C++ developer tools to... You know, to put more muscle behind uh, the, the, this issue without necessarily telling people go and rewrite your code in, in Rust. You know, it, it, it's a fine language. I actually think here's, here's something that I, I like. So uh, C++ has this notion of uh, resource acquisition is initialization, REI, right? right. And, and then the Rust guys took it and run with it and are uncompromising about it, right? It, it's, I, I think when I was in academia, we were talking about academia earlier. When I was in academia, one of the things I used, I like to do is how far can we go if we just stuck to these principles, right? Mm-hmm. I think I think one of the contribution of Rust is showing us, hey, this is how far you can go. At least so far, this is you know, this is how much you can do, right? And then you have to take into account some other factors. How do you design a programming language that is used by millions of of developers, right? No, the numbers I've seen, you know, either through uh, public surveys, and this seems to indicate that we have more than five million C++ developers. Five million. So, how yeah. do you design a programming language that requires five millions of people? You know, that can be used by five millions of people. Um, and if we want to go and and dump very advanced type theory into the hands of these people, uh, it's going to be hard to scale, <laughs> right? <laughs> if it require PhDs, we fail, <laughs> right? Because yeah. most PhDs, they don't actually want to write programs. They want to be managers or some other high level stuff, <laughs> <It's not> right? <laughs> right. Um, and, and, you know, and I like the idea. My son, you know, is not using C++. He's getting to high school. I like the idea that high school... Uh, you know, people can can use C++ and write right. programs. I don't want them to have to know advanced stuff here before they can write reasonably good program, right? So we have to do something in the space of making C++ simpler to use. And by default, when you use it, you write um, code that is dependable. So what do I mean by dependable? So dependable doesn't mean that it is always bug free or faultless it means that even if it has bugs it has enough mitigation there it doesn't take down the entire uh, you know server or you know applications and, and so forth so it may have bugs but you know on average you you get everything done you know, these days when you have cloud services they don't guarantee 100 percent availability right it gives you the three nines that's dependability Okay. And, and of course, okay. you, you can't put anything in a language that would prevent human logic error, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, right? And some of these security bugs we get, they are not all because of the language, you know, lack of functionalities. Some of them are just, you know, <laughs> logic errors. You know. So, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, I guess going back to the question you asked uh, about Microsoft Rust, yes. So, um I think Microsoft will always uh, 
be investigating new programming languages. Like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it's a software company that's sure. based on technology. You can't just say, oh, we have we have enough programming language. We are not going to look at it. No, 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 that's not going to happen. <laughs> so it will always be investigating new programming language to look at what can we do to solve these problems that we're having. And I think uh, Rust is one such language, but it is not the only one. I think there was another article in the news that says, oh, Verona is also being looked at. Verona is a research language this time that's being developed uh, by Microsoft Research, principally the, uh, by, you know, on the campus uh, in, in Cambridge. Mm. Right. Mm. And it's also, it's another take on on this idea of uh, resource management so uh rust does everything statically right is that is the aspiration right so there are you know we can actually talk to the, the guy matthew uh, uh, it, it, it tries to look at well you can't do everything statically like in rust if you want to write a static data structure like graph uh, you know, it requires some kung fu style. You know, like black belt kung fu <laughs> to get there. So, but we want you know any you know, a language that is used by at least five millions of people. They should be able to easily write <laughs> exactly the structures, right? So the very nice idea is some of these texts we can actually move them to runtime. So they they the design framework runtime system that that will support this notion of linear logic and you now it's more affine logic and, uh, and, and, and so you know they are looking at it and we'll see what how how far it can go and then you get to the play point where you have to do engineering which is you have the math the logic solid then you have real life Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to, you know, bring things together to make it scale. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we've got two other quick articles. Uh, this next one is uh, just a discussion on Reddit, and it's why is standard implementation so ugly? Uh, and, <laughs> yeah, there's some interesting discussion going on here, but the, the short answer is, you know, they have to use, like, the leading uh, double underscore because it's reserved for the standard library. Is that right, Gabby? Uh, yes, that is the primary the reason. Yeah. So, and the question, why, you know, you always have the why of the why. <laughs> <laughs> and the why of the why is, well, when we started, we didn't actually have good namespace support protection. Like, we have header files technology and we have macros. Right. Right. And, you know, as soon as you have that, you you get to protect yourself and and then the the standard carves this you know what we call namespace like you have certain identifiers that you say oh users can't touch it so this is a, you know a gentleman contract you know people can always go and break that contract and they get what they deserve and and in return uh, the you know the implementations you now some library implementation get to use those identifiers to do whatever they have to do, and, and the code is really, really ugly. Uh, I don't write a lot of standard library stuff these days. I used to do that when I was working on GCC, and it, it was just ugly, like underscore capital something. And uh. <laughs> Well, ho hopefully, uh, as we're moving forward, um, you know, modules will help, but, you know, mm -hmm. we as long as we have to support header files and macros, you know, mm -hmm. we, we get that thing. Right. But there exists a future, maybe, where they don't have to do that anymore with the oh, modules. Oh yeah, that, yeah. It's like if you um, if you start a new uh, project and you're very um, you know systematic about usage of macros, like no, you're not going to use macros. You're going to use something else. There are some good macros, like the ones where you have some kind of local if defs. Mm -hmm. Those are those are okay, but for the vast majority. You don't need macros, and if you're very systematic about that, then you don't need the ugly stuff. You can just write really beautiful code, like really beautiful, orgasmic code you can show you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the last thing is just a note that uh, we've been talking a lot about conferences being moved online, and the Italian C++ conference uh, was just a few days ago, and they're 
uh, you know, videos are all available on YouTube for anyone who wants to watch it that didn't actually uh, watch any of this live. So it's, uh, I think, worth pointing out for those of our listeners who listened to the uh, uh, episode of Nico a couple of weeks ago that he was one of the keynotes here. And right. uh, he is diving into some of his uh, hidden features and traps of C++ move semantics. So it's kind of dovetailed off of our conversation and the upcoming book that he has. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Gabby, uh-huh. uh, last time we had you on modules was still, I, I mean, that was what, four or five years ago we probably had you on yeah. first? Yeah, it was at yeah. the beginning, yeah. Right, so modules was uh, was definitely not done yet, but nope. is it now set in stone for C plus plus twenty? Is there any errata still being addressed? Well, so yeah, the first thing is C plus plus for no module for C plus twenty done. Okay. Okay. Um, so like the rest of the language itself, you always have some you know wording to. To look at and so forth but in terms of functionality and usage no way we have those things you know i expect that in the uh coming months and years we will be looking more at uh, how we leverage uh, modules like what tools do we build on top of the infrastructure that we have for modules what other you know capabilities like um in cologne for example so that was almost a year ago at the C++ standards meeting in Cologne in July 2019, mm-hmm. uh, Richard Smith at Google came up with a proposal uh, and that is leveraging modules for doing packaging in a way that is very principled. And I really uh-huh. like that 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 proposal. Uh, so we haven't gotten back to it because you know we have been racing since then to <laughs> to get everything lined up uh, for you know we released the the draft in Cologne. Then we got national bodies comment. So in Belfast, we were all busy um, addressing national body comment, and we did the same in Prague, where we signed off on C plus twenty. So we haven't gotten time to, you know, going back to hey, we have this thing. What can we build on top of it? You know, to to help the the C plus plus community, and we're looking forward to doing to be doing that uh, in uh, in Varna. I think that was at the beginning of the month. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Get canceled, you know. Yeah, no, COVID, uh, you know, uh, happened. But yeah, so in in the coming months and years, I, I do expect us to focus more on leveraging the basic infrastructure capabilities than we have. Now we can add you know, some other stuff, but not change the, the, the core of what we have and probably fix some semicolons or <laughs> this kind of stuff we do in, in the standards committee. Um, on the uh, Microsoft side, we have been making uh, you know very good progress. Uh, uh, you know, we were talking about Frost and Microsoft, you know, earlier. Like, mm-hmm. I can tell you that uh, Microsoft has been putting a lot of research just to make sure that we put, we're we we're delivering uh, modules implementation as fast as we can. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're doing this in the MSVC compiler, which mm-hmm. you all know has been around for a very long time. And uh, it is only very recently that we started having parse trees to <laughs> to, to do compiler work. We used to do, to, uh, to be using tokens. So when I started the implementation back, you know, the one that presented SCP Con 2015, okay. uh, I had to introduce some data structures, but what the compiler was using was uh, tokens. So, like, it, it, it's like, um, I don't know, uh, drinking coffee with fork. <laughs> it, can, it can be done, but, you know, <laughs> there are better tools to <laughs> get in there. So we're getting the better tools into the compiler, and, and Microsoft has been putting the resources there. Um, internally, the compiler itself is using modules. Uh, at least on a mod- in the modules component, using header, you know, header units and, and modules. And... Um, I will be also shifting some of my attention to uh, tooling around modules, and and you know some of it, this will be uh, open source. 
right? And 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 the thing that I want to show the community here is how your code look like organized when you use modules. So you'll be seeing modular codes from Microsoft, you know, in the near future. That around, sounds very around. exciting. Yeah, and, yeah. So if I can say a little bit more on the mm -hmm. on the module yeah. uh, topic, so I think. Every compiler that I know of so far that has been implementing modules has to um, process the modules, you know, interface, and then save mm -hmm. that in some form so that it can reuse it without having to parse and instantiate that kind of stuff all the time. And so every compiler has to do that. And so far, each compiler has been doing its own thing, right? Uh, it'll be actually interesting if uh, in the developer tools, C++ developer tools community, we can come into agreement on, oh, can we have similar format, or at least can we offer the same API to look at this you know, artifact that you produce from compiling uh, modules. And if we can do that, uh, so I'm not saying we are going to do Java class files, but this is the kind of thing that now you can think of is possible, but if you can do that, just imagine all the other stuff that you can, you know, you can build on top of it. You know, I think the uh, the, the the tools the code system uh, in Java benefited a lot from having one single format for right. hey, if you compile mm -hmm. your Java code, this is what it looks like. Right. Right. If you want to bind C plus um, plus to any other language. Today, you need something close to uh, a C++ compiler, or you restrict yourself to the uh, the poor impoverished subset of C++ that is easy to parse and, and, and handle at, at the wrong time, right? So you're not actually using the richer and safer part of it, right? C++ right. brings you tools to, to write safe and secure code we were talking about you know safety earlier but yeah. this yeah but today we don't actually you do those at the interface you know level because mm -hmm. we have to you know most of c plus programs have to or libraries components have to interface with other components written in other languages or you know you know this, this is what the language is good at but they're not using the safest part of the language to do that because we don't have the tool support for doing that. But imagine that you can describe the interface of your component as a module interface. Yeah. And you get compiled. Then you have this data structure that you can manipulate without having to require a C++ front end. You can go very, very far. You can do fantastic stuff. So that's what I'm thinking about and we we'll like to have the the tools ecosystem community you know uh coalesce around and, and push forward so um i am uh, writing a spec for what the microsoft compiler is is doing today mm -hmm. i expect to be able to release that to the uh the public uh Long before the end of the year, but we're already in June, so <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just putting pressure on myself. But um, but I expect to release that very soon and and get feedback from the community. Are you guys interested? Do you, what can you do with this? Uh, mm -hmm. If you're interested, are you interested in having other compilers? You know, get together. And do it. You don't have to take this, but this is what is possible. Can we improve it? We want to go to a different direction. What can we do? I think that's where I, what I want to do. Where I want to, to go, and then we can, you know, look at what tools we can build to let's say bring a a scalable version of borrow checker. Right? When people talk about Rust, they oh yeah, I have borrow checker. You now you you know you borrow this reference to that data, and then you're the only one doing it, and it's not going away before you come back, and and that kind of stuff. You can do something very similar in C plus plus. Yeah, it's a little bit more complicated, but you can do something very similar, very nicely when you have a good data structure that represents your, you know, your program. I I know when C++ modules were first, first voted into C++ 20 like a year ago, we, we talked a little bit at the time about how this separate paper was being written uh, about uh, module implementations. Is some of the work you're talking about related to that? Yes. They, oh. Yeah. Yeah. So... 
Um, the split representation, also this is part of work that I've done with Vianney. Um, well, um, 15 years ago, uh, it's on GitHub. Um, I'm now taking some time to revamp it and uh, update it and, um, and, and convince my fellow uh, co-workers <laughs> at Microsoft to, to use it more. Um, and, and for example, the code analysis team is seriously uh, looking into it, like using it in, in, in you know, in future release product. Um, j just to try to show the community, this is what we can do to bring greater safety and, and, and security to our community, to our users, right? Now, and, 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 and I'm saying this to emphasize the fact that Microsoft is not disengaging from the C++ community. If, any, if anything else, it's like it's pouring more resources into it. Right. I, I just want to debunk that, uh, sure. One more that notion. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah related the, to what you, you, you've been talking about, well, a, a bit ago you mentioned that you were, when you were first trying to do modules with the Visual Studio compiler, that you had a bunch of tokens and you didn't have an AST to deal with. And longtime listeners of our podcast, we've brought this up several times, so it's a, a little off topic, but I am curious, is that work done now? Is the is the Visual Studio front end now fully modern? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so that work is not finished yet, but... Okay. Uh, so the but is not oh we'll we'll do it no 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 it it's ongoing, and there are several components to this. So when we talk about it, the the Microsoft team using parse three. So it was not using AST. It was using parse three. So there's a distinction between okay. parse trees and abstract syntax trees. So abstract syntax trees is like it's abstract. So a bunch of stuff have been thrown away, right, from the concrete syntax. A parse tree is really a a, a reification of the the grammar production, so that's what. So when a grammar you know, passes your uh, your your program, the production that it uses to 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 pass it, then it is the test structure to represent all of those things. Okay. So that you, you know you can declare a variable at least in two or three or four ways in C plus plus, like in x <laughs> equals zero. <laughs> So int x equals zero with parse trees will be represented very differently from int x open curly zero close curly. Right. 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 Yeah. So you have different representation parse trees there. However, if you look at AST, you know, like essentially you can have one. You have a variable declaration. Its name is x. Type int initialize it zero. You're done. Right. right. So abstract syntax trees has abstracted a lot from the, the syntax, whereas parse trees like faithfully represent what is written exactly in the source code. So what the MSVC team has done is to introduce parse trees. So you can think of it as phase one of modernizing a compiler. Okay. And what uh, we're doing right now, and Gore, I think you've had Gore on your show too. It's so, been a little while, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what Gore is doing now is to move from the past trees to uh, the IPR, the internal program presentation, which is, it, it's more than AST. So we are jumping the AST thing, like, <laughs> instead of going to AST, we're, like, we're just going jumping the AST to go to what I call the abstract syntax graph. When you have a C++ program, you don't get a tree, you get a graph, okay. right? Uh, just imagine you have a class, class A, and you know, and you have a comparison operator. It takes two A's and, and returns a bool, or member function equal equal takes an A. So if you want to represent that class A, you have the class A, and then inside that class, you have a member function operator equal equal that takes an argument of type A. So you have a reference back to the class that you, you know, you're defining, right? So you have a, a static data structures in terms of semantics. Okay. Right? So you, you actually have a graph, you don't have a tree. Uh, so uh, that, that's what the team is doing now. It's going from the parse trees, the concrete representation, the source code, directly to the semantics graph, which is actually what you want when you're doing semantics-based analysis. Okay. Right. 
whether you're putting code gen or you want to enforce, you know, memory safety, type safety, the type checking, you're actually using the graph. You're not using the, the tree. You're actually using the graph. You want to be able to say, oh, it is the same class, the same class. Uh, sameness is somewhere you you cycle back to where you started at some point, right? It's not right. a tree. That sounds so, like... So that is what the uh, the Gore is doing right now, and and the code analysis team is leveraging his his work. Okay. And and that abstract semantic graph is the data structure that we save in in the you know in the module compile module artifact, what I call IFC. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so okay. the the documentation that I'm writing is to document this is the abstract semantic graph that you get from compiling a C++ program. And, and then you can go and walk that and, and do wonderful stuff. Uh, I don't know whether you were able to watch the talk that uh, Cameron gave on module tooling. No, there was the virtual C++ conference, uh, you know, a month ago, right. organized mm-hmm. by Sai and uh, Cameron, that camera, uh, gave it a talk on module tooling. And what he you know he presented the tools that he presented was based on on the afc uh and uh, it, it gives you it, it's an illustration of you know the tip the tiny tip of the iceberg of you know tooling in the 21st century for c plus plus we should try to put a link to that in the show notes yeah yeah, yeah I, I watched some of the virtual c plus plus talks i don't think i watched that one but i will okay, not find no. a link i'll, for it I'll send you knows. a link to, to, to that and it's it's a wonderful thing like and it, it, it's like you know to a 40 minutes talk, but it's really great. Awesome. It sounds like a lot of work is going on and that it's going to enable more um, code analysis, more yes. warnings, more static yes. analysis and, and Absolutely. all that. Absolutely, yes. And so, yeah, the code analysis team is also in a modernizing its infrastructure. Um, I, I think some of the plan that, you know, you know, things that we like is ability to... Uh, to use the Microsoft compiler as just, you know, um, not, not, not plug-in, but, you know, a tooling uh, uh, infrastructure. Like, you know, I, I like to talk about this idea of uh, MSVC SDK. Like, <laughs> oh. uh, so, uh, you know, that's the North Star, you know, that the team is is, is working around. And, you know, I'm, I'm very happy for that work that we're doing. So the compiler would be just one more tool that happens to use this graph output. Exactly. Fascinating. Okay. And, and you can also imagine that. So this uh, abstract semantics graph, you know, we, you know, I invented for handling module interface, but, you know, it has to represent entire C++. Right. Now you can just imagine you compile your code directly from C++ to that semantics graph. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Before you know, and, and then you delay co- delay code generation. You you don't attain platform independence there, because well, C plus C plus plus. No size of double is whatever the platform target says. And then as long as you do a lot of uh, Sphene stuff based on size of align of a bunch of other compartment things, you know some decisions are going to be made and baked into that representation. But you get very very close to, to to that right and and so this idea is not new you know some of the the implementation techniques that Clang is using is, is based on this right and, and and some of the discussion we had during the module summarization was that apple didn't want uh sorry apple wanted the ability to compile c++ to an intermediate representation that is not code gen and then later on generate code from, from there. So we needed to right. um, we needed to amend or uh, modify some 30 years old rules in the standard to make that possible. And they have to do with uh, things that we used to do because we didn't have modules, like static <laughs> inlines and, and other stuff. Right. And none of this work stopped last week when that article came out. <laughs> <laughs> not to my knowledge and uh, <laughs> just making sure <laughs> yeah you know uh, and i think my management chain hasn't given me any indication that we should all stop and and and, and jump on rust <laughs> okay, okay. It, like i said sure. yeah like, like i said it, you know anything if anything else because really really is uh 
doubling um, down on C++. It, it is a core language that the company supports and that promotes. Okay, and that promotion is not stopping now. It's for at least until you know some huge event happens. Right. Okay, so we've talked a lot about modules, but uh, you, you said when we were preparing for the interview that you've also been starting to focus a lot on concepts. So uh, what's your work been on concepts? And uh, yeah. Oh, okay, so yeah. concepts uh, also has been implemented in MSVC by Shang Fan, um, another principal on, on the team. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so now I can write code <laughs> with concept. And I can tell you um, that the front-end team is dog-footing concept in a compiler. So the MSVC oh. compiler is full of concept. Um, so I started using these you know, concepts as they were coming online in the modules component. And then Cameron say, hey, we should be using this more often. And then he just, <laughs> you know, run away with it. And uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've seen a lot of bug fixes coming from uh, John Caves. And I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, these are all concept related. And it sounds like we haven't cut them in the front end. And, uh, oh, yeah, that is because the back end, is going full on concept. So, the, <laughs> so the, the, the MSV compiler itself is using a lot more of this concept. And nice. and the things that we're realizing is when you use them instead of Sfini, the code is just, it, it, it's just simple, wonderful, right? It, you know, uh, I, I think some of the uh, patches that I've seen that I love is when there are a lot of write, like deletion, like <laughs> a lot of things have been no, removed by just you know, replaced with just a couple of line. It makes the code much simpler, more wow. robust, and you know. So that's what has been going on. And as I've been doing that, and and helping the rest of the team uh, doing that, like, uh, what lessons can I take from from this, and 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 then tell the rest of the community. So my, you know, I gave a one shot talk. At the virtual C++ conference that we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm, right. and and it, it was like no, that what I showed there was based on my experience trying to clean up stuff that we did that used to be there in the MSVC compiler, and so it is not it's not a technique that is unique to the compiler. It is broadly applicable, and you know. Yeah, I'll send you a link uh, you know, so you, you can watch it. it it's really useful. So um, I guess uh, I will have to talk to the C++ core guideline editors to to update the guidelines uh, to, to include the concept to, now, to, to show how you can write wonderful, robust, safe C++ with, with concept. And, 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 and this talk I gave actually specifically shows how you 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 re, you move runtime checks to compile time assertions that guarantees mm -hmm. statically something that you really wanted to do so you can perform you have a more performant code oh. at runtime so that's what it is all about okay now to me and, i and, if and i just, hear you, you love that <laughs> yeah <laughs> of course yeah <laughs> And if I hear less code, I think less opportunities for bugs also. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes. The bugs have to have somewhere, right? So <laughs> less code you have, <laughs> less opportunities you get for, you know, to give bugs to, to hide. Yes, absolutely. Now, often when we hear a, a concept, a con well, sorry for the, the overload of the term here, but when someone says something like Svene on the podcast, I would like to say, hey, could you explain that quickly for our listeners? But I don't know if it's possible mm -hmm. to quickly explain <laughs> Svene for our listeners. Right. But if you could, if you think that you could give them an, an illustration that would work over the air here for, for how... Or why concepts is able to remove a bunch of code that would be awesome okay so i'm not going even though some of these codes are sphene i'm not going to explain sphene because i don't actually yeah. want people to know about sphene <laughs> <Okay. Right. laughs> if you know if you know about sphene you have already gone too far please come back <laughs> <laughs> right so the the basic notion about um 
concept is that it is just a predicate over things that you manipulate at compile time. So those things could be a type, could be an integer value, or it could be an address of a function, address a reference to a function. Those things exist at compile time, right? And since we have had const expert, now we can have more values, not just integers, but structure value, you know, values with structure at compile time or class times, right? Um, so in the codes that I showed in my, in my talk, the what happens is that you have a, a table. Usually you have this situation where you have a table. You want to map, let's say, enums to some actions or to some names and that kind of stuff, right? And you want to ensure that uh, the, the table, you have enough, you have the same number of element entries in the tables as you have in enumeration. And then you go by hand, uh, do this kind of mapping, and, 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 and then you write some assertion, make sure that uh, when someone is trying to index into this table, uh, now the index is not out of bound, right? You don't want memory safety, right? So wh when you look at it, like, hey, it looks like there's some kind of one-to-one, -one abstract one-to-one -one correspondence between the, um, the index, the valid index into this table and the numerical value. And we can make that, it, it, it is a static structure, so we can actually express that at compile time with hmm. const expert function, right? Now you put that, since now it's a compile time function, you can turn it into a predicate. Remember, a concept is just a predicate. So you express that predicate as a concept. Now you write your generic function that takes uh, a type T that satisfies that concept, you know, possibly with the table that you want. Well, remember, a, a function, a function template is instantiated only when it is used. And with concept, it has to be used and the predicate has to be valid, which means that whatever invariant that you wanted to capture, you capture it and that invariant is satisfied. Then you can get into the body of your function and execute your, your, your code. So you have moved the runtime complexity, you know, go through the table and make sure that everything is okay. Just move that at compile time. The compiler has access to that invariant now. Now it can just go and directly index into, into the table. So you have less code to run at runtime, but most of the checks has been done at compile time. Because the runtime code is small, it actually means that you wrote less, not more. Right, right. right. And also the expression of the concept is very, very simple. So an example is in, in, in the video, and I, I don't know how to talk about it, audio, but the, the basic line is that you have some static invariants that you can capture as concept because just predicate over compartment values. I think of type source as values. And then you parameterize your function based on that predicate. And boom, you just now focus on the real work to, to get done. Right. There is no possibility of missing if you capture your invariance properly. I definitely have to check that out. Yeah, and and I was actually preparing a, a talk on uh, for CPPCon. If we get it going, <laughs> and if the talk is accepted, where I wanted to show some techniques that I used uh, based on concept to describe this abstract semantics graph that we were talking about earlier. Okay. Yeah, so again, what I did there was just to capture the algebraic structure, the static structure, and turn it into concept. And then the rest of the code just flow. And and I had to describe this to uh, to Biane. I think his answer was, you're having a good day. So I think it must be, <laughs> so I think it must be good. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, Jason, you have anything else you want to ask? Do you want to talk about contracts a little bit too? I'm actually, if you don't mind, uh, interested in going back to modules just for mm -hmm. a minute because yeah. we've seen a lot of articles and discussion about modules and mm -hmm. it sounds like you at Microsoft are actually putting them to use. So I'm curious what... Um, if, if you've seen uh, like any misconceptions about modules that you would like to dispel while you have the opportunity to, or any best practices about using modules that you would like to share. Yeah. 
So, you know, that's a very good question and, and, you know, right on topic. So I've been thinking a lot about programming with modules. Uh, my CVPCon talk in uh, 2019 in Colorado um, was actually specifically on that topic. Like, if you're going to use module, these are the best practices. Right. And before that, I, I gave a talk also on good practice, you know, with modules in, in Paris in June 2019. Mm, and okay. and I'm also working on you know ongoing books you now to to try to oh. to, pre to present yeah you know I only got 24 hours in a day I heard everybody <laughs> got the same so it is hard <laughs> oh. but it, you know it, 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 language feature is of no good use if we don't know how to use it properly right so right. I have to do that kind of for anybody who wants to help me it's most welcome. Um, yes, I've seen a lot of uh, articles on the web, and the ones that I won't say infuriates me, but close is when they're purely uh, clinical description that are based on what the standards wordings are like. Uh, I don't know the standard have what they got four or five types of uh, module unit. I don't even know how many we have. I only get to know that when I have to review compiler code. Otherwise. I don't know. Okay. My perspective, from practice perspective, you get an interface and you get an implementation. An interface has distinguished that we use have header files. If you use the MS, MSVC compiler, you dot IXX files. This that is where you just specify. Here is my component. Here are the things that you can call directly, and the rest is my business. So my business, I'm moving it into dot CPP file. Done. Like. What you're doing today with the, you know, head of files and if you can continue doing that, except you have a, a tool that allows you to actually enforce the, the boundaries of your component and you get to directly express your dependencies so we know what is going on. And as I was indicating earlier, we're going to have a bunch of other tools that's going to use this information like through the entire tool chain to, to, to help you being productive. That, that, that's all you know you need to know there is don't don't spend too much time like oh we have module partition you need you know sorry i don't <laughs> i can't responsibly tell people go and and and, and learn all these four types of people but as a tool builder i have to support those scenarios for completeness but from right. a practice perspective just make your code very very simple um what is did what did i want to to say Oh, yeah, macro. Please, please. I, I know we love macro. And I, I know they allow you, they are very flexible, right? You, you can you can manipulate, it, they are malleable, right? But that is exactly why it's very hard to write solid, you know, a component when you make too, many, too much use of them, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so think about expressing your abstraction in terms of classes, functions, and concept, and not textual replication, right? Capture the abstraction and name them with something other than <laughs> macro name. So that's what I, I would say. Um, what else? Yeah, concept, concepts for functions and modules. Yeah. I wish we had contract, but uh, yeah. that, that would have helped a lot in terms of the, we were talking about safety, increased safety, that would have helped a lot with code analysis. Um, there were a lot of uh, controversy at the end and some misleading descriptions in the uh, in the public. Um, I just hope that uh, we get to be doing it better this time around. Uh, like we uh, back in 2018, we we got an agreed upon uh, you know, minimal facility that mm -hmm. everybody said at a the time they can live with. Like everybody who was involved. No, nobody yeah. got what exactly what they wanted. But we got something that was basic enough that we can work with. Now Microsoft is very much heavy onto um, code analysis, static analysis. And it's not just static analysis. No, I say code analysis because you have analysis that happens pre compilation and then that happens post compilation. So post compilation, like you know, Microsoft runs tools that 
after banners are produced, it goes in and, and analyze them you now right. for mm-hmm. various reasons. And then you also get runtime analysis things going. So it is really about code analysis. And, and co- what contracts are? Contracts are just uh, expressions of expectations and, and um, um, guarantees that a, a facility, you know, an abstraction function, uh, you know, say like, I expect that the arguments that you're passing in verify these predicate. Again, you see a theme there? <laughs> predicate, predicate, predicate. Right. right. And and when and I guarantee that when I can complete, when I complete, I'm making this guarantee back to you. Like when I return to you, I guarantee that the states of the program will be such that this predicate holds. And that is powerful. Right. And we got that facility. People who just want to have runtime verification, they can have that. And people who want to be able to express these guarantees through contract, like express, you know, use them in code analysis, can also do that. Then right after uh, Rappersville, um, some people were party to the agreement that they all say they could live with, just decided to rewrite the entire facility, which mm-hmm. was not acceptable. So. Mm-hmm. What happened in uh, in Cologne was that there were a slew of papers that were put to vote, and through you know it's death by hundreds, you know, thousand cuts. Right? Um, through slew of these little papers, the the facility was gutted, and of course, some of us were unhappy with that. And I think Nico, Nico Jujitsu is like, well, if there is so much controversy, we should just yank this thing out because clearly what is there no longer has the support that it had in rapper sphere. So it was taken out. Uh, we all agree it should take out, it should be taken out. And that's what, uh, unfortunately. And my hope is that the new study group that was formed after Cologne is now looking at contracts again will come with a, a better uh, consensus that we had uh, before. It, it is it is a shame that you know we have to delay this while the problems with safety are so much current, right? Yeah, but yeah, uh, we'll see. I, you know, it's the last opportunity, but no, hopefully with the learning with the uh, infrastructure that we have with modules we can you know convince something more better people. yeah we can convince more people this is what you get additionally if you make it easier to do code analysis all right right okay well it's been great having you on the show again today gabby uh, i look forward to seeing some of the stuff you are working on with modules come to light thank you very much uh now having me on you know it's really uh, wonderful talking to you yeah thanks again and and stay safe you Thanks, too. you too.